So, here at Air Studios in uh, London with John Weber, uh, mastered Devox's uh, Telegraph album. Uh, but I wanted to take a minute to talk about your general approach to mastering. A piece of music, say, comes in, a okay. new client, existing client. Okay. What's the process? What's kind of going through your mind to start with? So I guess the first thing we do is we sort of um, check the file. It's usually a file that comes in these days, but we can still deal with other formats, tapes and, and whatnot. Um, so the first thing we would do is, is check that on a technical level, make sure that it sounds good. Mm. Um, listen through to the piece of music, make sure uh, if there's any sort of kind of problems with the mix, then um, we can we're in a position these days where you can easily relay that information back down the chain to the mix engineer. Yeah. And things can be fixed um, at the previous stage before mastering, um, which is a really handy uh, modern convenience, I guess. Yeah. Um, so we kind of we kind of act as a sort of consultation base, other sort of consultation basis these yeah. days, um, a lot more than we used to be able to, where someone's just gone into the studio um, and done an SSL mix and they've yeah, spent this is all you've got 500 quid on. a day in the studio. Yeah, exactly. And you have to kind of deal with what you're given. These days, we have the luxury of being able to go back a stage and fix any particular problem. So that's become a sort of uh, more of a part of the mastering process than it used to be. Um, so, yeah, we sort of lend an ear to it. Um, and then... All being well with that, uh, what we'd then typically do is we would um, load the file into uh, sort of playback system. So we may play back, usually we play back from a DAW. So we use uh, Magic Sequoia here, um, <clears throat> which is great for mastering. Um, uh, it's particularly good because it has a sort of an object-based way of working. What that means is every audio region can be an individual um, object where you can actually insert processes onto the region yeah. as opposed to just on the mixer. And side. I'll grab some overlays of the screen yeah. as well yeah, so yeah, we, no can, we can interject some images. Yeah. Um, um, and then... So it's, so for the case of the album, it's mm -hmm. about, from the get-go, creating the album, the intent of the whole thing, the flow of the whole piece. Yeah, absolutely. It's not um, a track-by-track... Track. Well, we can do. I mean, obviously, people do give us tracks and singles. Yeah. Um, but you're already thinking of the kind of journey... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think mastering really, it truly is actually getting um, a bunch of mixes and, and bringing, a, bringing a project together, bringing an album together yeah. and uh, putting the final touches on an overall project and thinking about it from a more general standpoint. Uh, because I think when people are mixing, particularly, they're obviously kind of dealing with things as they come uh, yeah. on a track, track, on a track to track basis. And we're kind of there to sort of put a sort of overall sheen on, on everything and trying to bring everything together. Um, yeah, there's less of an overall how does the base of track one compare to track two element to mixing? Like you said, it's kind of yeah. you're in that zone of that track and trying to balance the yeah. stems or the masses of tracks you're given. Absolutely. And actually yeah. with experience and um, working on lots and lots of albums is actually a big part of our skill is intuitively knowing when that is an issue and when it's not because you can go too far with one discipline compared to mm. the other. And what I mean by that is, um, as you say, Right, two tracks, one's much bassier than the other. Now, a bad, a bad mastering engineer might go, well, let's make this track much bassier, so it matches yeah, that. Yeah, of course. But yeah. you're actually, you're kind of then ignoring what's right for the track, so it's finding that balance between the two, and I think it takes a lot of experience and time and uh, going over and over what you do as a mastering well, engineer a to realise when to make that correct decision and when not to. Yeah, and I think that only comes with experience. However good your kind of technical chops may be, Yeah the artistic intent and being able to yeah, understand absolutely. what the intent of the artist is yeah. as well as your own creative yeah. kind of approach. Yeah. That just takes time. Yeah, and I'd say that's probably the most important part of what we do. Um, I, mean, I can talk about kind of what we do. We load a file in, we play it out through a D2A converter, but we then choose whatever kind of processing we want to use in, in the outboard um, world and then we sort of pass it back in to dig digital again and capture it. Um, uh, for an HD converter, and that's basically how we work when we're actually mastering tracks on a track to track basis. But it's 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 about so much more than that. Um, it's about, as you say, the integrity, the artistic integrity, um, supporting the artist's vision. And I'd say every project's different because some people really rely on you to kind of do what you do and and to make those decisions. Whereas some clients have a real idea themselves of what they want, and yeah. the, they'll be there by your side. Um, asking you to use your technical expertise to kind of bring that to life for them because they 
it's kind of beyond their remit uh, yeah, at that point. Yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of dealing with people, there's a lot of dealing with people's expectations and what they well, want. Yeah, that final output stage, it's so mm -hmm. important. There's no... It's, it's a joke of a term, of course, but the fix it in the mix, I'll fix it in mastering. Yeah, you yeah. can pass that joke stupidly down the chain, <laughs> but you can't pass that any further. No, no, no. You're the end the of that chain. with us, yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in terms of process, taking the Devox album or any kind of wide range in mm -hmm. electronic music, be it modular or otherwise, do you have any processes that you feel particularly work well? Like, uh, in terms of kind of technical use, is it layering multiple soft stages of compression to get more level? Is it certain, you know, saturation, then EQ, stereo, width? What kind of technical things are you looking to do? I guess it applies to any music, not just electronic music. But well, it does, yes. And um, interestingly, with this album, uh, it, we, we didn't do kind of what you might typically expect to be done on an electronic album. Um, I think a lot of people have this kind of preconceived idea that um, electronic music is quite... Uh, processed and crushed and, uh, and and pushed for loudness like you know well I was, it was kind a of kind of put in incorrectly put in a genre like this into the sort of EDM bracket almost. yeah and it was a total uh, pleasure to hear this not <coughs> like that I heard oh, it totally. un it's unmastered actually... and then mastered yeah and I mean knowing it was you and being aware of your work I knew I wasn't going to get a horrible squashed dance master over mm -hmm. over this kind of album but it just breathes yeah, there's a life to it. There's clearly things done, however subtle, just to pull it to life. And there's bring actually it to two tracks on this album where we used a uh, YSDS1 as an expander. So instead of okay. compressing it, we we're actually uncompressing, trying to breathe, as you say, add breath to the overall sound and the overall texture, um, and and sort of impart dynamics into the music as, uh, instead of going the other way and, and squashing it. I've, um, I think. Sometimes electronic music can be a bit too kind of lifeless and on one even kill, you know. There's no yeah. dynamics and no musical integrity there. It's just kind of four to the floor and a load of padded stuff. And yeah, it's yeah. just all about kind of being excited and, and banging. But, you know, this is a much more kind of... Uh, there's well, a much wider palette of sounds here yeah. and, and, and emotions. It's not a banging dance album. It's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of atmospheric at times and then it's kind of dancey at times and it kind of shifts through the gears um, so that was what was interesting to me um, so for this specifically for the Devox mm -hmm. album did you find a particular chain that you d just really spoke to the audio that you were given through the gear or, or the um, software no actually funnily enough I used a different so I used quite a lot of outboard EQs on this album um, we jumped between pretty much all the ones we have here um, Again, I'll, I'll overlay images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, for example, we, we used the uh, Chandler uh, TG Curvebender EQ on a couple of tracks because it kind of added that kind of rich tonality um, in the mid-range. And is that a case of you listen, you're listening to the track and your experience tells you which one? Yeah, uh, yeah I think intu intuitively. You know the gear well these enough. Things, well, yeah, over and over again, you kind of know what to go for. Um, and then on some tracks, they already had quite a lot of that kind of density in in the sound anyway so i wanted to go for something a bit cleaner so i might have used the um sorry <coughs> the dangerous music back cq for example just to open things up a bit um and i think we use the api api five uh 5500 on a couple of tracks as well um that's quite good at adding a bit of energy back in but you've also got that kind of a bit of analog richness mm. so how much of the the process was dictated by knowing what format it was going to be in. Well, funnily enough, we... Um, or was it just mastered no, for the quality we had, we of had, the music up front? We, I think we had vinyl in mind from the start, funnily enough, and um, quite often in the modern age of music, people expect one master for one thing and then another master for another. So, well, you see all For these... example, um, very compressed CD masters don't make good vinyl masters. Uh, no. They can end up sounding very soft and very over-modded and, uh, and not translate very well to a lacquer cut at all. Um, luckily, uh, these guys didn't want that from the off anyway. We were kind of, we wanted like a warm, invoking kind of um, immersive kind of experience listening to the album sonically. Mm. Um, and I think that was the idea everyone had from the off. So actually, I didn't really need to do too much adjustment um, when I mastered the vinyl. Um, I seem to remember that the mixes were a bit different for the sides, so we had to run stuff twice um, in terms of the outboard processing and, and whatnot. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, the, the approach to actually the CD and the vinyl were very similar in, okay. terms, in terms of the sound and the overall palette, the sound and the overall tonality and levels and the way the album flows. Yeah, and thinking of the vinyl, how much are you having to change what you're doing as you get through the album in terms of bass response being better at the start of the record, losing top end as you go in? Sure, okay. You know, tonal response of the vinyl changes you'll know far more than <laughs> about this yeah. than me but as it, you get through the album are you having to readjust as you go or um well is... with this there wasn't too much of that to consider uh, first of all it's a double album so we, we were able to sort of um only use say sort of uh, 70 80 percent of a side uh, so not cramming and not in have to so worry too many much. yeah no, so all those kind of end of side ish issues you get with vinyl where the top end rolls off or distorts um that was less of an issue because we, we had that freedom to be able yeah. to, to do, we, had, we had the space per side because it's like 15 minute sides um, so, that, so that was great so that kind of really helped with the uh, with the overall quality of, of the sound uh, from start to finish um, there's you know none of that distortion was really an issue mm. uh, secondly the kind of music it is there isn't there wasn't too many percussive high frequency issues um uh, for example, there's no vocals, for example, and one of the, one of the main um, problems with cutting alongside um, is when you've got a very sibilant vocal and you've got those yeah. kind of peaky, high-frequency blasts that um, are not vinyl-friendly, so we had none of that to really deal with. So um, there's there's a lot of fidelity, I think, that we've got onto, onto the record. And yeah. it and obviously when I cut the record I was using like scrap lacquers and stuff and they being between the, the the digital playback which was again which by the way was done uh, I think we did it at 96k so we did okay. it quite high res so we had the most integral kind of master possible to cut to vinyl it's not just a CD master cut to the lacquer we, we created a high res file um, for that purpose mm. And one thing, just to, we'll go specifically through the album with, with Paul and Nino, but um, for anyone getting into or needing to master their own music, just to give it maybe a mm -hmm. soft touch to before it goes online, mm -hmm. have you any kind of tips or tricks on, obviously don't do anything too heavy handed, <laughs> but a, a default chain maybe that would work, should people be looking <clears> to, you know, for, for the kind of gearheads that are watching, I make modular videos, so there's... There's um, a ton of gear heads. They so probably <laughs> want me to say, yes, go use this, do this and do yeah, this. Yeah, uh, without specifically I, doing that, is I can't there anything... Honestly, I can't honestly do it. Because <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Sound doesn't work like that. Um, yeah. I knew that if, would be if the I, If I said, <laughs> compress this... I, mean, I remember when I was first getting into this, I remember you read like Sound on Sound... Can I say that? Can I? Well, read a, a, um, a media music technology outlet yeah, kind of say that. yeah yeah whatever <laughs> but you'd read like an, art an article and I would say oh yeah get a compressor this ratio set it to this ratio it. and don't compress by more than 3 dB uh, gain reduction and then you know get get a get an EQ yeah. set it to 10k and then boost the shelf by half a dB and that's going to work every time so well, without, no. <laughs> without going too specific yeah. is there anything you know the order that things come within our <coughs> considerations to make in certain frequency areas or is there any kind of general advice that people can try and apply i think the best thing you can do really um i think low end is always a problem um in the modern um actually even in big even in big rooms big mix rooms um the low end can be very hard to judge um and you can only really get a full perspective of what's correct when you play it in different on different systems and in different yeah. environments um, I think it's very hard to master a track in the environment that you mixed it in because any yeah. kind of problems with that environment are just going to mount up they're not going to be uh, fixed and eradicated um, which is one of the main reasons why I'd always advocate going to a mastering engineer so again it's hard for me to <laughs> answer that question because I have this kind of beliefs and, um, and also kind of you know experience of, of knowing what why mastering doesn't work when you do it yourself um i think that well, i think there's a huge thing to just having someone else do it whether that's totally. a, an engineer like yourself yeah. or just i mean it's hard to measure these things or just a mm -hmm. friend at a similar level similar yeah. ears different system yeah. just getting out of that space yeah. and your own ears and having someone else i think the most important thing is make sure your mix is good and then we 
basically don't really do too much to it when it's a good mix. And if there is something kind of wildly, I mean, quite often I'll have to go back and to, to people and say, you know, the, this, the bass end is quite wildly too much. And they're like, oh, really? It sounds fine on my speakers. And then um, they might then compare it to a commercial track and then realise, you know, that, 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 that there's an issue there. Um, I think that's probably the most... <laughs> Well, it, it's you as a person and the experience, obviously, but mm. that's probably the most valuable thing is that uh, being able to address the mix. Mm -hmm. I think having someone tell you what's wrong is probably going to have a bigger change. Yes. If they can Absolutely. fix these things and you be able to feed back and, and get this across to them, then yeah. what Absolutely. gear you've got to adjust it afterwards. Plus, I think it's also a good point to say that I think the, the kind of concept of mixing and mastering the, the lines have come quite blurred for some reason. Yeah. Um, I mean, the amount of times we get a mix which, oh, could you master it? Make it sound great. And then they, they've piled all this, uh, all, this, all this processing on the master bus of the mix. Mm. Now, a master bus is called a master bus because that's where you put the processing for the mastering. Yeah. <laughs> so they've kind of attempted to master the track themselves. And that, is, that can be creatively valid because, especially if they've got it on um, during the mix process and they're mixing in. Because they're they mixing that, into the process. Exactly, that's what, exactly what the concept of mix bus compression is and then yeah. um, the mistake with that is that people will do a mix and then put a mix bus compressor on it's like well no that's not how it works the actual the gain reduction and the way a mix compressor works um, is part of the mix process but when you're you're making decisions going in feeding, that's feeding signals that you want into that it. sound if, you, if you're exactly you know, are you producing valid. to be loud yeah. from the off because yeah. that's a very different approach to just capturing raw sound Absolutely. At yeah. which point you don't just want to squash it out. No, no, no. Anyway, so, so we spoke about um, <clears throat> the vinyl specifically. Mm -hmm. Thinking of downloads and digital, how much of your time now is spent, you know, thinking about playback levels and average levels on YouTube and Spotify? And um, honestly, very little. Um, is it still all just about I've, making the, the song or the album? Right. It absolutely is, yes. And I think it's those kind of... The way that the, the modern streaming world operates, where it, I think kind of every streaming service... Well, they all um, service, have their own average in... Well, they have their own average, which, to be fair, they're all... They're all, they're all between, between... They're all within a few dB of each other. Yeah, so there's, they are. I, th I think that's actually kind of a positive thing because there's less... Um, there's less need to just squash things for, for loudness sake. I like and, that it's killing the yeah, loudness it, thing, but... I, it's I very wonder... CD era kind of yeah. mentality. Um, but with a, with a <coughs> dynamic album uh, like Telegraph, mm. do you have to think about maybe we need to add a little bit more compression so that we're not, so we're in this average level somewhere? Or does that still not even come into the thought process? No, because I think the, at the level we mastered, the, if you think about the actual kind of peak output, or, or the average level output um, of the master, it's pretty much at or slightly above where most of these streaming sites set the level anyway. So yeah. it's going to... It's not squashed, so it's, it's pretty it's much going to slot sit. into that world. And then if you've got, like, the latest... Um, uh, who can I uh, sc scold? Uh, Lady Gaga on the release <laughs> or something, and that's been, like... Uh, and actually, to be fair, her album sound pretty good. Um, but do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, um, latest commercial... Yeah, the late, latest R &B guy... Or something. With, yeah, I don't know what the kids listen to now, but... Um, yeah, something that's massively squashed. I mean, the problem with the issue with that is it's going to have to be turned down. Yeah, to, to so match its peak is down. Yeah, to match the integrated loudness level that that streaming site wants. So then, ultimately, this is louder because its average will average out within that system. But this still yeah, has not peaks necessarily loud, not necessarily louder, but it'll sound well, a lot more, more open. Yeah. It won't have that constrained. Yeah. yeah, peak loudness is louder. Exactly, because their average is at exactly. Uh, and if anybody thinks that something's louder sounds better, that's they need to kind of. Also Look the at the reason why. Controls. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, because they're actually that's the psychoacoustic thing. That's you listening. Uh, that's your brain telling you and your ear telling you that it's more exciting because it's louder. Um, if you then turn that audio down, I mean, everyone talks about this now, so I'm sure it's pretty common knowledge these days. But you turn that level down and then listen to a version of your mar your, your source mix, even say it's a good mix and you 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 really crushed it. And you're like, oh, this sounds really exciting and punchy and loud. If you then turn that down, say, 6 dB to match you, the average mm -hmm. level of your mix, and then you flick between the two, Yeah, it's nice. That, that's the real acid test. It's like, have you made it better? And most yeah. of the time you haven't. Most of the time you've, you've caused damage and made it less exciting and flat sounding and the bass is all constrained and doesn't have the extension and the roll and, and the top end's got fizzy and 
hard sounding and it's it's um yeah, it's really interesting yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I think it's positive and as I say in the, in the new age it's funny how the digital age has actually allowed us to do that where <laughs> music's become to stop squashing <laughs> yeah yeah less squashed and we we have um, we can be a bit more expressive as mastering engineers as well not just trying to make everything loud all the time yeah, yeah. and I, I don't <clears throat> think anyone watching will have expected you to say you were using expanders to mm. add dynamic range and effectively lower the average level than just compression and limiting. I think it's the opposite of what some people think mastering actually is. Yeah, well, there's loads of headroom in the mix anyway, so the overall level of the mix is well louder, but we, um, there was, it was more to do with the um, integrated dynamics within the mix and, and, and expanding that and making, making it kind of breathe a bit more and have a, you know, uh, a bit more dynamic. Yeah, so we'll, we'll let Paul and Nino uh, get into some specifics on the album sure. uh, with you as well. 